Well, glory be to God on high indeed. As we stand, let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the word. And please, Lord, by the light of your word, would you illuminate our thinking now? And we pray it for your name's sake. Amen. Please do have a seat. So here we are on uh, Christmas Eve 2022. It's come around uh, quickly again, hasn't it? And I'm assuming that by now uh, most of you have got your decorations up. Um, if not, I'm thinking it's probably a little bit too late. <laughs> you, know, you might have left that one uh, just a little bit late in the day. Um, but I do love Christmas uh, decorations. I love uh, nativity scenes. I love Christmas trees. I love um, ornaments. I love the cards. Um, I, I love all of that. What I'm not so keen on is uh, sorting out the lights year by year. Do you know what I mean? You, you, you go to get them out of the loft, you've got to get them untangled, you've still got to check the bulbs somehow. I mean, you know, I've got LEDs and I'm still working out why that one, that one, that one, I thought that those days were gone. But no, sadly not, we've still got to check the bulbs. But when I have done that, and when I have sorted them out and untangled them, and then when we turn on the lights with them, comes the magic, doesn't it? When that happens, <laughs> when the tree goes from dark to light, it's like, ooh, and I, oh, that's better. <laughs> With the Christmas lights, it seems, come the magic. And lights make all the difference, don't they? Whether they're on our trees, whether they're on our houses, whether they're in the street outside and we see them um, on, on the streets, they, they, they make all the difference. They change everything. It's what light does actually, isn't it? It changes everything. Just think about that for a moment, how a, how a light can change and, and, and change a situation or change a mood. You know, that romantic meal for two made all the more romantic just by the flicker of the candlelight. <laughs> Changes everything with the candlelight. Or maybe you're one of those commuters on a bike, you know, those early uh, winter mornings or those late uh, afternoons and, and that bright bike light is shining up the cycle uh, pathway so you can see it and you, you know, it's piercing through the darkness. It's showing you, it's illuminating the way home. Or think back to, to when you were a child, fearing that monster lurking in the shadow of, you know, in the, in the dark corner, the dark recess, that shadow of your bedroom. What could, what could chase those, those monsters away? It was turning on the light. The light changes everything. And John's introduction to his gospel is, is like a burst of light that changes everything. Literally changes everything as he illuminates the true identity of the Lord Jesus the one whose birth we celebrate at Christmas. And John isn't so much interested in the traditional Christmas story. I'm, I'm sure that's not failed to sort of <laughs> to, to, to get your attention that, you know, you, you've not, he doesn't sort of, he's not interested in shepherds, no, um, there's no wise men, uh, there, there are no angels uh, for, for, for John. Um, I mean, the only reference he seems to make comes a little bit after what we heard read earlier when he writes, the word, that's Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. That's about as far as he goes. There's none of the sort of traditional uh, nativity scenes or, or, or elements that we would normally associate with. And we've got to ask, why is that? Why does John do that? Well, I think it's because he wants to draw our attention to another aspect of the incarnation. Something perhaps a bit more profound, something more foundational from the off. And so if you've got your Bibles in, in front of you, do, do turn back to the start of John's uh, Gospel, 1063. That's the, 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 the Bibles in your, in your seats in front of you. Do turn back to that. Just going to look briefly, look, just, just a brief look at this passage. And just three things, briefly, that John tells us about the identity of Jesus. Three things. Firstly, I think John wants us to know that Jesus is our eternal God. He's our eternal God. So if you look at verses one and two, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. 
He was with God in the beginning. So at the beginning of his gospel, John wants to take his readers, he wants to take us back, way back, to before the beginning of everything. And to do that, he transports us, he transports his readers by mimicking the very first line of the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible. And so we get this similarity with Genesis chapter 1, 1, which says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know that. That's the first, the well-known first verse of the Bible. But John, in effect, says, do you know what? Even before that, even before the in the beginning, even before creation, Jesus existed. He existed as part of the everlasting three but one God. We have here just at the start of the gospel, the building blocks that help us to uh, understand the doctrine um, of the Trinity. A doctrine that is so important, it is proclaimed uh, weekly in, in, in churches um, around the world. It has been proclaimed regularly in churches down through history. This doctrine of the Trinity, one God, three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, eternally existing and working together in perfect, loving relationship. And John introduces the Son as the Word. At this point, he doesn't name him. That is going to come uh, again a few verses on in 14 and 17. But John introduces the Son initially as the Word. The Word who was not just with God, but who in some brain-twisting way actually was God himself. And this matters. And this matters because if Jesus really is God, it means that God is not distant. He's not uninvolved. He's not unfamiliar with the experience of what it means to be a human created being. The one whose birth we celebrate at Christmas is none other than God himself, our eternal God. That's the first thing. Secondly, I think John shines a light on what Jesus was up to in creation. So if you have a look at verse three, he says this, through him, through Jesus, all things were made Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In other words, Jesus wasn't created, but as one person of the three but one eternal God, he was actively involved in the creation of our universe. We could say he was doing the work of creation that God the Father had ordained. In that sense, he's, he's like the agent of creation. Anything that was made, anything Anything that at one point didn't have a beginning and then began to exist, anything like that was made by Jesus. Again, the question, well, what, why does this matter? Does this matter? Well, it matters because the creator became like his created in order to allow his created to become a new creation through faith in him. Only a creator has the authority to do that. Can't just make that up if you're constrained in some way. But the one with the power and the ability and the authority is the creator. And so we see here, Jesus is, is if you like, our creator at the beginning and he will be our creator at the end or our recreator at the end. Jesus here, he is our eternal God. He is our creator. And then thirdly, Jesus was born to be our light. Verse four. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. Again, John is, is drawing us back to that first book of the Bible. He's drawing us back to powerful images of life and light. Remember, Genesis tells us that God spoke the universe into existence. And when he had done that, he filled it with the light of his truth. 
And he then began filling creation with, with life, vegetation, sea creatures, animals. And of course, the pinnacle of all that, us, humanity. So John is saying that in the beginning, God the Son created humanity and he filled it with life. But something went wrong. How do we know? Because next, John contrasts this light with darkness. Verse 5, the light shines Oh, not in the light. The light shines in the darkness. But the darkness has not understood it. And this is why we celebrate at Christmas. This is why we celebrate that the eternal word, Jesus, the son of God who created life, has come to earth as a human being to bring life again to humanity. It's begging the question, what, what, what went wrong? Why the need for light? And what is, what is the life that the word brings? Well, listen to this quote from an Anglican bishop who says this. For many, Christianity is just a beautiful dream. It's a world in which everyday reality goes a little bit blurred. It's nostalgic. It's cozy. It's comforting. I'm not sure everybody would agree with that, but I think some of us might agree with that. And maybe even some of you are here tonight and you're seeking a little bit of that cozy nostalgia that's associated with that kind of understanding of Christianity. But the bishop continues. He says, real Christianity isn't like that at all. Take Christmas, for instance, he says. A season of nostalgia, of carols, of candles, and fire, firelight, and happy children, but that misses the point completely. That's pretty emphatic. That misses the point completely. Why does he say that? Well, he says that because Christmas is not here at the end of the day to just remind us that this world is actually just a pretty jolly good old place. It's not what Christmas is here to do. It's quite the opposite. It's a celebration designed to remind us that the world is actually a, a shockingly bad place and it's in desperate need of rescue. Mike was helping us to understand that and unpacking that a little bit for us on Wednesday night if you were here at our carol service. Planet Earth is a dark place. It's full of war and terrorism and disaster and things that go wrong for no apparent reason whatsoever. I mean, look, there's stuff in the news today. There's been stuff in the news in the last couple of weeks. I just think about those poor boys on that icy lake a couple of weeks ago. Why does, why does that happen? There's darkness. And Christmas, John says, is like God lighting a candle or turning on the lights. It's like God flicking the switch of a, a torch. It's like, it's like hitting, hitting the lights on in, in, in the room um, or them being reconnected after a power cut. You don't do any of those things during the day. You don't need to. You don't need to do those things when the sun is out, but you do them in darkness. You do them at night. You do them when the wind has blown down the power line. You know, that's when we do it. And Jesus was born to be our light in the darkness. He is a light shining in the darkness of this world today. And the question is, have you understood that? The question is, have you understood him? Or as that other reading that we had from Corinthians reminded us, has the God of this age blinded us to the truth of that light? You see, the truth is, it's not just the world out there that is dark, is it? Our own lives are pretty grim too. I know mine is. All the stuff that happens, the words that come out of my mouth, the things that go through my mind, my selfishness, my ability to bear a grudge. And in this messed up world, the Bible says that we love darkness instead of light. And our thoughts and our deeds are offensive to the very one, the eternal one who created us. And so we try to replace him in the center of our lives. And we replace him with pathetic imitations. Imitations of light. 
and we sin and we struggle and, and, we, and we try and just, just do that and, and we're desperately trying to find a hope, we're desperately trying to find a purpose, a meaning to our existence. What is that meaning? Is there one? There are many ideas out there. There are many philosophies out there. But according to John here, life is not summed up in a philosophy. Life is summed up in a person. In a person. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. In him. It's personal. And if you are looking for the essence of life in a philosophy, then ultimately you're going to go away empty handed. But if we come to the word, if you come to the word, to the person of Christ, you will find that he is life. John would later record Jesus as saying this. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's a promise and a half from Jesus. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. A little bit before that, John also recalls Jesus um, uh, saying that he, he, he's, he's come to, to give people life to the full. This light. He wants to give people life to the full. Maybe you're here this evening and, and you've never thought of the Christian faith in this way before. Well, if that's the case, can I say this? Jesus truly is the light of the world. If you accept him as your saviour, he can light up your life, no matter how dark it is. No matter how much chaos you feel there is, or emptiness, or darkness. He can bring order, he can bring fullness, he can bring light. And the darkness, no matter how dark, the darkness, even though it doesn't understand, it cannot, it cannot overcome the light. Maybe like me, though, you've been familiar with the light of life for some time now. And I think our challenge is to read these verses afresh tonight. And as we do, we, we sort of meditate and reflect on the awesome, perfect creator God who made all things, sustains all things, sustaining everything, who's provided this phenomenal rescue package for us. And as we do that, as we reflect on this God, I want to encourage us never to forget two things. Firstly, don't underestimate the darkness, either in here or out there. Don't underestimate the darkness. Because if no one less than, as we've seen, the eternal God, if no one less than the creator God, the preserver of all things, if no one less than him could deal with our sin and take away that sin, then sin must be a far bigger deal than we sometimes think it is. Friends, do not underestimate the darkness. That's the first thing. Second thing, don't underestimate the life-changing power of the light. <laughs> don't underestimate that either for your own darkness or the darkness out there. We are talking about the divine word. Our savior is none less than the eternal God. He was creator in the beginning. He will be creator again at the end. Our hope is sure. Our future is certain. We have the light of life and by God's grace and you know, it, it, the, dark, the darkness will not, it cannot overcome it because of God's grace. It will never overcome it. So we don't underestimate the darkness, but neither do we underestimate the life-changing power of the light. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we prepare to share your fellowship meal together, Please would you help us to remember how much it cost you to rescue us. Lord Jesus, please help us not to underestimate the darkness either around us or within us. 
But Lord, we're grateful too that you are the ultimate Christmas gift of the life-changing light. And so we simply want to praise you and say thank you to you for that tonight.